welcome to my channel. So today not only marks the 1st of November, but it also marks a brand new kind of idea that I've brought to my channel. I'm not sure if all of you stuck through to the end of my last video, um, but I made a sort of announcement. Um, I'm going to be doing a new little mini series every single month from here until I run out of ideas, basically. So far, it's going through May. Um, so every Saturday will continue to be missing persons, but Wednesdays will switch every single month to a new mini series. And this month's mini series is Solved Cases. Now, a lot of people. I don't know how they'll feel about talking about solved cases. I know a lot of people are here for the mystery. I know a lot of people are here to help spread awareness. And it seems as if the only places you can really do that are on my missing persons videos and things that have no ending. However, the deeper I started to look into solved cases, the more I realized there's so much to learn from them. There is so much awareness that can be spread with them. And despite how horrible a lot of these cases that I'm going to tell you about and good things do come out of it and hopefully that includes a wealth of knowledge to you guys from listening to these cases. So Solved is the series of November and I really am looking forward to continuing this with you guys and I really hope you're excited about it and on that note let's go ahead and jump right into the video. Today's video is on Jacob Wetterling and this case is a large one. This is a very well known one and it's also one of the most highly requested videos that I have gotten and it is one of the main reasons I decided to start a solved series around 9 p.m. on October 27, 1989 in St. Joseph, Minnesota. Jacob along with his 10 year old brother and his 11 year old friend Aaron were hanging out at Jacob and Trevor's house. His parents were out having a night to themselves. The kids didn't have school the next day, so they wanted to do something a little bit fun, so they thought they would go and rent a movie from this tiny little like mom and pop gas station just a little bit down the road. So they all hopped on their bikes, grabbed a flashlight, and started their trek. The area they were in was not an extremely populated in neighborhood necessarily. There were some like backcountry roads along farmland that they had to bike through in order to get to this store. So they made it there, absolutely fine, got themselves a movie, but on the way back, something absolutely horrific and every parent's nightmare took place. A masked and armed man appeared out of nowhere and told all the boys to throw their bikes in a ditch and lie face down on the ground. The man asked each boy their age and then finally asked Jacob's brother to run as fast as he could to the woods and not turn back or he would shoot him. He then told Jacob and Aaron to get up off the ground, turn around, and face him. And at this point, he essentially picked out Jacob and told Aaron to, once again, just like the brother, run to the woods and not look back or he would be shot. Jacob was then handcuffed and forced into the passenger seat of this man's vehicle and unfortunately would never be seen alive again. Hundreds of National Guard members, law enforcement, volunteers, friends, family, everyone was desperately searching for Jacob after he disappeared. I mean, think about it. It wasn't just a case of, oh, he might have run away. It was a man with a gun forced him into a car and threatened to shoot everyone he was with. You know, this is absolutely horrifying. They were on horseback looking over 30 miles. They were shoulder to shoulder going through swamps and rivers desperately trying to find Jacob and not a single thing turned up. The closest thing that they had was a similar occurrence that had happened 10 months before Jacob had gone missing with a little boy named Jared who was 12 at the time. He was forced into a vehicle by a man late at night, driven to the middle of nowhere, sexually assaulted, and then essentially told the same thing. Run to the woods as fast as you can. If you turn around, I will shoot you. They hadn't solved this case. This little boy was fine and he was alive, but he had still been attacked by a predator and they could not find out who did it. But based on the similarities in the story, they did believe that these two were connected. On December 16th, a man named Danny Heinrich was actually listed by the FBI as a person of interest in Jacob's case. When they brought him in for questioning, he claimed to not know anything about the night that Jacob disappeared and he had no idea what he himself was even doing the night that Jacob disappeared. So he was then released. 
The family and other organizations tried tirelessly to keep Jacob's case in public eye. As we've seen multiple times before, unfortunately after a short period of time, these cases and these people just seem to slip into this abyss where no one talks about them anymore and no one pushes as hard as they did at first. So they desperately tried by using vigils and releasing balloons and doing anything possible to gather more attention to Jacob's case. Then on January 12th, Heinrich is again interviewed. Police this time confronted him with a pair of shoes that they had found along with a set of tires. Yet again, he maintains his innocence and after questioning is released. This time he even volunteered his own hair samples in case they needed them for further testing only to the police proving his innocence even more based on his willingness to help in the investigation. And on February 9th, 1990, Heinrich is arrested on probable cause for being linked to Jared's assault. He put on this huge show for the police. He appeared extremely empathetic. He maintained his innocence, revoked his right to a lawyer, and really convinced the police that he had nothing to do with Jared's attack. He was later released without being charged yet again. Family and friends still really pushed and pushed for Jacob. In 1994, Congress released a new act, and if I look down, it's just to read it. It's called the Jacob Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Sex Offender Registration Act. And this is the first thing ever that required states to track sex offenders and have them on a list where they could see them and people could see them at all times. In 2008, Jacob's parents started the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center where they educate people about who takes these children, why they take these children, and what you and these parents can possibly do to stop it. Then in 2009, the 20th anniversary of Jacob's disappearance, they were hoping that this would bring some sort of renewed energy to the case, some sort of new information. After all, it had been 20 Many years and that is plenty of time maybe someone's conscience to bring them in the right direction to tell the truth or maybe someone who knew something wouldn't be scared anymore and they would come forward however none of this happened then on June 20th of 2010 they searched the farm that was right beside where Jacob went missing and where he was actually physically taken they found items of interest and they even took away six truckloads of dirt but again this led them to nothing then in 2014 investigators started making connections between a lot of other cases that had happened in the Painesville area and the area where Jacob went missing prior to his own disappearance. There was a blogger who had been researching Jacob Wetterling's case for all these years and she uncovered all of these articles about five other boys that had gone missing between the summer of 1986 and the spring of 1987 and they all had shocking similarities. So she brought this to police and that's when they really started investigating. Then by July 28th, investigators were searching Heinrich's home in hopes to link Jacob to the attacks against Jared and all of these other boys boys who had been let loose because after all Heinrich had lived in this area in the time of all of the attacks. Finally by October 28th federal investigators arrested Danny Heinrich on child pornography charges and linked him officially to Jacob's case. Then on July 10th 2015 huge news came. That sweater that had been taken from Jared actually had DNA on it that matched Heinrich. Now, keep in mind, when all of this first happened, DNA testing was not a large thing. It was still in its baby infancy stages. So this was a huge, huge step, almost 25 years later. At this point, Heinrich was pretty much cornered and I think that he knew it. By late August of 2016, Heinrich's lawyers contacted the investigators, the federal investigators, and told them that an agreement would be possible and it would include a confession, which at this point was absolutely huge. Federal and Minnesota officials all got together and met with the parents to discuss this possible agreement and this possible confession and they decided to go ahead with it. On August 31st, 2016, Heinrich led FBI investigators to a farm in Painesville about 30 minutes away from where Jacob had been abducted. During the investigation that day, Jacob's red jacket was uncovered, the one that he had been wearing the night that he disappeared. On September 2nd, investigators then returned and also unearthed a t-shirt with Jacob's last name on the back. Then on Saturday, September 3rd, 2016, officials announced that they had in fact found Jacob's remains. Then on September 6th, Heinrich confesses in a courtroom to kidnapping, sexually assaulting, and murdering 
Jacob Wetterling. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail on what exactly happened that night because it is quite disturbing. Um, but I will give some of the information. He had been driving on random roads, really seemingly having absolutely no destination, when he saw the three boys pass by on their bikes with a flashlight. He decided to park in a nearby driveway and wait for them to return. When they returned, he put on his mask and he did everything that we had already stated before and that's when he had taken Jacob into the vehicle. He drove Jacob towards the direction of Painesville where he lived, which is also where Jacob's body was found. Thanks to a police scanner, he was able to completely avoid the cops along the way and did a real big circle of a drive to get to the area he was going to. He then took Jacob out of the vehicle in the middle of nowhere, essentially down this gravel road, took him to the woods, assaulted him, and then absolutely panicked when he heard a cop car drive by with sirens. At this point, he said that his gun had not been loaded the entire time and he never had an intent of using it. But when he was spooked by this cop car, he then told Jacob to turn around and proceeded to shoot him two times. He then drugged Jacob's body away where no one would see it, went home for a few hours to wait until later on in the night. When he came back with a shovel to bury Jacob's body, he realized that there was no way he was going to get it done in enough time. So he literally went to a construction site, took a bobcat, and dug this area up put Jacob's body in. He then took the bobcat back to the construction area, took Jacob's shoes and threw them down in a ravine, hoping that they would just be washed away and left. He became a little bit nervous around a year later and when he returned, he noticed that part of Jacob's jacket was showing and he panicked. He unburied the body, collected everything except for, I want to say, the jacket, and then moved him and buried him in another area. During this testimony, he also confessed to being the one who attacked Jared. However, this is where the deal comes into play. Part of the deal was that he would not be charged for Jacob's murder. And I know that is probably infuriating every single one of you watching this video. Um, it infuriated most of the town. You know, his biggest charge right now is one charge for child pornography, and that is it. He is going to serve 20 years in prison, and that is it. Um, that is infuriating to me. I know there are some other possibilities that the judge did say could happen that would keep him locked away for good. However, I don't know what those are, and I wasn't able to find a lot of information on them but he spent 27 years hiding this secret and making these parents suffer an endless amount of pain that is just never going to stop. That doesn't stop at 27 years now that it's figured out. That's gonna keep going for the rest of their lives and this man is only serving 20 years in prison. I mean, to me, that's absolutely insane and infuriating, but, you know, the parents said that at this point, that was the only way. It was the only way that this man was ever going to confess to what he did, and at this point, they just wanted to put Jacob to rest. The attorney, Andrew Luger, I think is his name, he said that it came to a point that they had searched every single lead, they had searched every piece of land over and over and over again. They had searched for three decades. We're not going to find any answers themselves. And this offer was their only hope and their only chance to get any sort of justice for Jacob. This is where I'm going to talk about something so important that's learned from this case. You know, these parents took a situation that's so horrific and they created so many beautiful things out there for other parents to benefit from. You know, I cannot imagine the amount of pain they're going through and they will be going through the entire family, but the good things that they were able to do in the midst of all this absolute terror is absolutely amazing. So I really wanted to use this video to talk about a resource that is so great for anyone who has lost their child 
um, and that's the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. You're constantly asking what more you could do, and this is a great option. They accept donations, and the donations that you give help in so many incredible ways, and it doesn't have to be a ton of money. Anything can help. They provide these things called hope bags for survivors, for children that have been recovered and are being reunited with their families. Usually when children have been taken or have gone missing, when they are returned, they have little to nothing with them. And these hope bags have clothing, they've got toiletry items, shoes for them to wear, temporary fast assistance for the first day that they are, you know, being taken back and brought back and reunited, which is extremely, extremely important. They also help families with travel assistance. Um, sometimes these families can't afford to go to where their child has been found or vice versa, and that can be a huge help for some of these people. They also offer therapeutic assistance for people who are now struggling with what's happened to them, what's happened to their family. Um, even people who are still missing their child, they're, they're dealing with those emotions. They are dealing with the day-to-day -day struggle of keeping going and that can be extremely beneficial to them. I also want to make it aware that if you have personally been affected or someone you know has been personally affected, they can sign up for their Team Hope. If you're on Team Hope, you can help other families that are in crisis, that need someone to talk to, that need to be told it's going to be okay, that need to be helped in taking steps forward and m navigating this insane thing that no one ever thinks is going to happen to them. I just think this overall website and organization provides so many amazing, amazing resources for people who are going through it or have gone through it, are trying to piece their life back together, and that is so incredibly, incredibly important. I will leave all the links down below. The donations that you make from that link are in any way, shape, or form going to be given to me. They are going directly to this organization, and I strongly believe that this is something worth giving to. Jacob did not have a great ending to his story, just like unfortunately a lot of missing and exploited children do not, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. But if there's one thing that you can take away from this case, don't ever stop. It is always worth it. Keep pushing, keep pushing, spreading the word, keep these stories alive. If you can share a missing persons poster on your Facebook page or at work or pin some up around your area, that is going to do an incredible amount of good for these families and the person that is missing. So take action, do something. On that note, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to check out all of my social media links down below. Hit that subscribe button to join the family and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.